Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Zimmer webinar uh, entitled State of the Art Diagnosis and Treatment of Keratoconus Patients, a part of the Crosslinking Expert uh, Meeting 2020. I'm Shari Awad, and I will be moderating this session, and I will be speaking along with a super panel of speakers, uh, Professor, Professor Theo Seiler from Zurich, Switzerland, uh, Professor Luis Esquerdo from Lima, Peru, and Professor Gerard Schmidinger from Austria, Vienna. Uh, we will leave the question and answers to the very end, but you are encouraged to uh, put your comments and your questions all along as we go through, but we'll leave, uh, uh, the, we will answer them at the very end for the sake of time. Uh, well, without further ado, I will start for the first talk. The Galilei thickness progression, a fixation independent method for early keratoconus detection. So we all are familiar with the thickness progression reports as um, uh, published first and promoted by Bellin and Ambrosio. And I think they are great reports and um, they do help a lot. But I always feel that there is something that could be improved in them. Like in that case, uh, in this case, a keratoconic patients with the right eye minimally involved and the left eye much more severely involved. And as you see in the, in the right eye, there's not much information we can get by looking at the thickness progression. While with the left eye, we can notice that the, the curve deviates a little bit, skews, and then levels off again. Uh, even in that case, nothing uh, major stands out. Uh, the Galilee has now thickness progression reports. And even though we have the same spatial profile and percentage increase as the ones that a lot of uh, uh, clinicians are used to, what I'm passionate about is actually a visual report dubbed the corneal thickness progression report. And actually it's not just a thickness progression, it is a speed progression of uh, cornea thickness per millimeter in every point you see in the cornea. This is like an instantaneous thickness progression, uh, which makes it a speed. You can see how the, uh, the progression goes infranasal, infratemporal, supratemporal, and so on. And again, it's measured by micrometer per millimeter. Now, let's go back to the same case we've seen before. And um, we see up the Bell and Ambrosio thickness progression. And let's look at the visual map we have down here. In the right eye, the eye which was minimally involved, if any, you could easily see that the infranasal thickness progression is much faster than, uh, sorry, the infratemporal uh, progression is much faster than the supranasal. Now, this is hardly picked at uh, uh, the traditional or conventional thickness progression reports because they average out all the meridii, <clears throat> so they dilute these things. And again, they're just thickness progression and not a speed progression, so they might not pick up very early changes or tendencies. Now, if you look at the right eye, at the left eye, the left eye is much more involved. And as you see here, um, even though the progression is almost the same in the hemi meridii, but if you look at the central one to two millimeter, you have a huge uh, speed difference from the very center of the thinnest point down to one millimeter um, in uh, uh, radius. And this is not picked up uh, when you look at the conventional map. Again, you have another increase in speed at about four to six millimeter of diameter. And this is picked up again when you look at the map, at the conventional map, but it's much less because it's actually dilutes everything. And that's the importance of looking at uh, a visual uh, speed maps of the corneal thickness. So we've developed an index to make these maps more numerical uh, and objective. And this index is actually has been, uh, pub well, have been um, uh, reported at the European Society and has been submitted for uh, peer review. And as you see here, we've dotted the sectorial thickness progression report because we looked at sectors of 15 degrees from one, two and four millimeter diameters and looked at their absolute uh, speed in thickness progression and as compared to the exactly opposite hemi meridii. Um, and as we noticed, we saw that um, at about one millimeter, the cutoff for the maximum sensitivity and specificity with a high area under the curve is 12.99 micron per millimeter. Double that is 24.8 millimeter, the cutoff when you go to a two millimeter uh, diameter and 50 when you go to a four millimeter diameter. And again, if you look at the area opposite to it, uh, the cutoff is 21 micron per millimeter when you see uh, when you look at the difference between the values of four 
uh, from either side of the um, hemisector. And hence, an AI-based index combining all these parameters was developed, which is sensitive and specific down to the 99%. Now, a few cases to discuss, um, like this patient with thin pachymetry, asymmetrical uh, bow tie and, and inferior steepening, posterior curvature showing double inferior steepening, but the BFS, the best fit sphere, just shows an elevation that is completely normal and it's below uh, uh, the um, central um, meridian. So looking at the other eye, exactly the same can be seen. The BFS shows a displaced apex, but nothing really abnormal stands out. Now, if you look at the thickness progression maps, you see that there is obviously an increase in the progression inferotemporal compared to supranasal. And it's 50, which match our keratoconus criteria. And the difference is more than 21, which also matches our keratoconus uh, uh, positive criteria. The other eye is even more dramatic, 55 microns at four millimeter. And then the difference at four millimeter diameter being more than uh, 21 microns, again, labels this patient as keratoconus. We send this patient for biomechanical evaluation to further uh, uh, check that point. And we notice that the CBI shows 0 0.57, which is obviously very normal with completely normal uh, uh, thickness progression profile. Again, looking at uh, the other eye, 0 0.8 CBI, and uh, even the SPA1 is also abnormal with also normal uh, thickness progression. So again, our thickness progression on Galilei could predict early biomechanical changes without having to resort to um, um, a, a conventional thickness progression map. Now, one extra feature of that uh, report is that it is fixation independence. So let me go quickly over what is um, the fixation here. Um, we all know that the corneal vertex is dead center of the Purkinje dots you see on the Galilei. The pupil centroid, obviously you could see it, and the geometric center of the cornea is the center of the geometric limbus, which is almost an ellipse. Now, a patient with a high angle alpha is a patient with a huge difference way from the corneal vertex to the geometric center, as you can see on the left-hand side. If you take off the automatic centration on the Galilei and you center back on what is supposed to be the geometric center, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, you could take an image, a, a measurement from the left and making it look like what you see on the right. So basically a very weird, funky, kind of asymmetrical best fit sphere can become a perfectly normal, healthy and physiological uh, uh, map, as you see on the right-hand side. Another example is this patient. Again, you could see that there is an elevation on the temporal side. It would, is this keratoconus? Is this angle alpha that is high? We, we're not sure, but if you recenter on the geometric center of the cornea, you get a perfectly nice PFS. And hence, I know that this is not keratoconus. This is um, just artifact from the angle alpha. Now, Again, to re represent that visually, I want to you to see the schematic where the visual, uh, the visual axis is dead center with the geometric center, the cornea, geometric center of the cornea. And what you see is a BFS that looks very symmetrical from all sides. Now take that same eye and then take the visual axis a little bit away from the geometric center and let's refit again the BFS. And what you see is a artifactual increase from one side and artifactual diminishing from the other side. And this represents what we see typically on these uh, corneas with the temporally elevated BFS, since most of the visual uh, or corneal vertices are, are actually nasal to your uh, geometric center. So that's what we see most of the time, a temporal elevation. In temporal elevation, would it be keratoconus or would it be angle alpha? Now, again, as you see on the maps, vertex centration up, geometric centration on the center of the cornea down, and you see a major change in the BFS, but not much of a change in the thickness progression. Now, the thinnest point does change, but the relationship of the points based on the thinnest point around it do not. And this basically, again, gives us a conclusion that the thickness progression is independent of fixation, and hence we don't have this bias as much as we do have with the BFS. And again, keratoconus necessitates multimodal imaging, and that's what Renato Ambrosio eloquently say it. And then um, as you look here again, uh, we need to look at multimodal uh, uh, maps, if you want, of the same imaging modality. The posterior elevation here is kind of 
ambiguous. Is it angle alpha? Is it true elevation? We're not sure. There's no really index for it. We look at the thickness progression and it's clear. And we look at the posture curvature, by the way, on the Galilei and they support each other. There's something on the infratemporal side of the cornea is not looking right. And that patient biomechanically has corticals. So again, what's the problem with the traditional conventional posterior elevation uh, map? The problem is it does not have a numerical index to account for all these changes. So what I mean, the left-hand side is clear. This is keratoconus, right? But how about here? Is it displaced apex or is it a uh, displaced visual axis? We're not sure. We cannot label that patient keratoconus. How about this down here? Is it asymmetrical elevation? Is it from the angle alpha or is it truly a nearly asymmetrical elevation of the uh, temporal BFS heralding early keratoconus? This we cannot answer from looking at the BFS, but we can answer by looking at the thickness progression report. So that's the advantage of the report. Again, we need to always look beyond and think beyond the BFS and the regular conventional thickness uh, reports. Thank you. The next talk will be Professor Luis Esquerdo. And he will be talking about improving visual outcomes for keratoconus using intracorneal ring segments assisted by femtosecond laser. So first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation. My topic will be the use of intracorneal ring assisted by femtosecond laser, in this case with SIMR. So this is the main indication for implant intracorneal rings are the primary corneal ectatic disorder. And secondary, like for example, post uh, LASIK, ectasia, or post trauma. So, the main objective of the main target of the intracorneal ring is to shrink the cornea. There are different um, shapes, and also, like for example, this one, uh, there are segments, you have different brands and even different shapes. For the for these rings, you have also circular rings, okay, like these two ones, the major ring and the carrier ring, with different position. Like once we can um, put it on the pocket in like a pocket or tunnel. So I will show you during the stop. And you can have also different shapes, like progressive ones. So in, it's a gradual increase of the thickness or different shapes like a double ring for special situations. But why with femtosecond? Because you can customize this treatment. You have gonna have for sure more accuracy for the depth while you are cutting. You can also be guided by all internal OCT, intraoperative OCT that we show you. You have uh, you can pre-programmate uh, trajectories for the different segments. You have manual option for customization of the trajectory. I will show you also. You can have one or two separate tunnels with two different depths possible. So look, this is case of 2002 with this basic ectasia, right? Uh, this patient came after one year. This is the corneal map at that time. Remember 2002, I didn't have a fento. And this happened to me that with the movement, when I tried to make the tunnel, okay, the flap move. So I have to lift it and try to manual again, look for the radial depth, and then I had to release this flap. The result was fine, but was very traumatic. So now we have this uh, uh, interpretive OCT that can allow me the exact depth for the position that I'm going to implant the ring. In this case, this is a post-operative with the ring, and I can see that I went to 380 microns and was very exactly. But of course, we can have complications, right? Even with the Fento. The main complication or the main cause in this, in, in this paper for intracorneal ring segment explantation was extrusion and the poor refractive outcome. So we can have extrusion, 
and migration. Look at horrible cases. Okay. So it can happen. So can we avoid it? Can we improve it? Well, um, you can have that with a similar one, with a similar uh, pento laser. Uh, you can have this new approach. We are doing two separate incisions, and is is not anymore perpendicular. It's bended in order that if you have any kind of migration, we're gonna try to avoid the extrusion of this ring because we are doing not a perpendicular cut with the fenton, right? So this is you can you can customize even the two incision, the separation of the incision. And the insertion is easy. Right. So just to show you again how you implant the ring for one incision and for the other one. Remember, with that, it's going to be impossible that going to be overlapping of the two rings because there is no connection between them. And look, look how fantastic you can uh, customize two different rings separated and look to the right with two different depths because on the temporal side, it's thinner than the corner. I don't want the same depth, some depth than the nasal. That's why I can customize, okay? And even, let me move that. I can customize the gap between them. Five degrees, ten degrees. So that's for me is is fantastic. Uh, we published that in Cornium. This I think uh, two years, three years ago, with one year follow up with no case of obstruction or migration. But what about the refractive or aberration outcome? This patient of twenty seven uh, years have this corneal map, and one nomogram, nomogram suggests to me one vertical. Uh, one ring in vertical position. This another nomogram with the same patient told me no, must be horizontal. Well, there are many cases that we as ophthalmology, ophthalmologists deal many times. So in this case, I'm not sure where implant the ring. So what I'm doing is enlarging the tunnel. Okay. Then I see the results. I implant the ring as the first nomogram told me. But if you see the results, doesn't improve the best correct visual acuity. That's been failure okay, of the ring. You must improve the best correct visual acuity. So that was the uh, original position of the ring. No improvement. So what we did was just to move the same ring we didn't uh, so, so we moved we didn't remove the ring we didn't change the ring we just changed the position okay according of the of the best correct visual acuity uh, result and, and look after that how this patient improved to 2020 best correct visual acuity so we call this adaptive uh, intracorneal ring Right, it just in order to move uh, according of the result, we published that this in 2019. So, in summary, what we are looking for now in keratocorps, what we are looking for now is for refractive keratocorps. So, what I mean with that is because many times we correct one eye with a corneal transplant, maybe, and the other eye with ring. Or maybe just PRK one eye, another one nothing. But many times, this patient, after many things we did, okay, this patient are not happy because they are asymmetric. They are too much of anisometropia. Okay, so can we prove that? This is why we change this term. Or we are putting this term like refractive keratocorns. Uh, this is a new book is coming from um, next year. Uh, with uh, Dr. Enriquez and Dr. Manis and myself. And in this chapter, we are putting this refractive keratoconus. So that's been the patient after intracorneal rings 
maybe after cornea away from guided, okay? The idea is to finally try to finish with him and be the best and correct visual activity. So we can combine it, for example, with toric phacic oils, right? In order to improve that. Or, or patient with DALC, we can do cornea away from guided treatment after that to improve the aberration following but PRK or fake KVL. In summary, intracorneal ring can be therapeutic and refractive. Our target is to improve the best coronary visual acuity, to improve the coronary aberration. We're going to have uh, better results if the fraction and the coma axis coincide. If not, you can try to enlarge the fentanyl tunnel like I showed you. Okay. But always remember. Look not only for therapeutic but refractive outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Louis, for this wonderful talk. And uh, next will be Professor Theo Seiler, and he will be talking about femto dog dog demystified with the femto second technology. Professor Thay. Thank you, Shri, for this nice introduction. Um, Ahmad, let me give my kind. Greetings to all my friends and colleagues in, in, in Lebanon. And I'm very much looking forward to see you and our colleagues uh, very soon. Hopefully, we will be able to have the Zimmer Academy next year in spring in Beirut again. Uh, and I, would, I promise to come. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Now, now let's go to the Fenter Second Laser Assisted Dialogues. And you may have recognized now it's not DALC anymore, it's DALCs because we have different types of DALCs now coming up. And I'm talking more about the, let's say, the, the, the uh, principles about this DALC procedure. And Professor Schmiedinger later on will give you detailed information how it works and how good we are today and uh, what we are going forward in the next year. Now, this is a patient uh, coming in with case in the order of 70 diopters in one meridian, 60 in the other one. Um, th this guy cannot use contact lenses. Uh, you can do a laser treatment. Customized cross-linking never does 20 diopters of flattening. So in essence, we'll have to help this guy to make his cornea round again. It's not, not bulking, bulging forward so much. Now, on the other hand, this, this cornea is, is good in terms of the endothelium. It's a normal decimates membrane. The, you know, the, it, it's like rubber decimates, so it will shrink together. And actually, uh, if, if we replace only the deceased part, he may see very well. And that's uh, a very important point because this is how, it, at that time, he was 20 years old. And most probably he will, and Professor Schmiedinger will go more into detail later on, uh, after 20 years, about 40% of the, these keratoplasties, if you replace the cornea, may need another keratoplasty. Now, now if you go forward, um, he may end up getting during his life uh, at least two, maybe three, or even four of these keratoplasties. And, and that usually is not tolerated by the body at all because whenever you uh, look from the backside on this cornea uh, with, with a diameter of 12 uh, millimeters and you remove 8.5 millimeters and replace it, you are losing 50.250% of the endothelial cells. Now, if you're 20 years later when there is no endothelium living anymore of the transplant, but it's replaced by uh, the host endothelium. If you do then another 8.5 millimeter replacement, another 50% of that. Now we are down at 25% of the endothelial cells. And that is why uh, start with 2,500, you're down at 1,200, then you're down at 600. So a third keratoplasty will never take place anymore because there is no endothelial left to support that cornea anymore. So in essence, uh, doing penetrating keratoplasty always uh, can be twice, maximally three times, but if you need a fourth time, there's no space and no place anymore. That's why uh, 
very early on, uh, the, uh, people like von Hippel, even 150 years ago, were talking about um, lamella keratoplasty as the way to go. And only about 20 years ago, the deep lamella keratoplasty came in because they said, hey, we are removing uh, the stroma and the epithelium, whatever, but we leave the decimates membrane and endothelium in place. And uh, we take that out and replace it by another one. And that was called deep anterior lamella keratoplasty. And to my best knowledge, that big bubble technique that everybody's using today in the world was the first time used uh, in, in Riyadh by, by uh, Abad and uh, by Klaus Teichmann. And they uh, promoted that whole technique to, give that, to get that deep anterior lamella keratoplasty as is done today. Now that DALC has advantages and Professor Schwedig will repeat this and uh, give, give you more information on that. Now we do have only in rare cases relevant immune reactions. Uh, we do have, uh, except that sometimes vessels are growing into the interface if, you're not doing, if you don't do a good job. Uh, the patients usually after one month can use contact lenses, so the visual rehabilitation is good because we are not afraid of rejections, we can use uh, scleral lenses right away. We don't use that much steroids anymore and reoperations can be done by just changing the button, leaving the endothelium in place. And even if you lose between eight and 10% of the endothelium during uh, such a redulc, it's still much less compared to, uh, compared to a penetrating keratoplasty. And, and then have in mind that there are strong indications for dulc. Uh, that is one thing is keratoconus, uh, others but are, are corneal dystrophies, uh, we do have some degenerations that can be done with DALG. Um, you can even do an eccentric DALG in, in, in some of the PUCs, uh, the peripheral melting areas. So in essence, DALG has a lot of strong indications. And uh, so, so among us corneal guys, we say today, uh, if, if a DALG is possible, do it. And only if you uh, miss something or you can do a DALG or during surgery, it turns out DALG is too time consuming or difficult, then you try and convert to uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Sometimes decimate uh, tears, you get a decimate tear and uh, you're losing pressure inside the eye. And, and th then you have to convert to the uh, penetrating keratoplasty. And uh, all the reports that we see in the international literature uh, have, have a very broad spectrum ranging from 10 up to 50%. So, and if the big bubble does not work reliably, that is an awkward piece of work because you have to, uh, sometimes it takes up to two hours if you have to, if you have to, to, to um, dissect decimates membrane from the residual stroma. And that is the true reason why DALC has gained a certain amount of, 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 of surgeons. Uh, and you may see that, that, is, uh, that those are the statistics of the Australian Register of Keratoconus. And you see it started uh, in 2000, 2001, and then got up to 25, 30% and stayed constant now since nearly 10 years. And the reason is, that it's too time consuming in private practice. Sometimes it's uh, really uh, a financial problem. Always, also, if you do, if you do a DALG, I in Switzerland get less uh, money reimbursement for, for that surgery compared to penetrating. And indeed, if I'm doing a penetrating cataplasty, I'm done by 45 minutes. If I'm doing a DALG, sometimes it takes two hours. So it's also a financial problem that, uh, that the reimbursement systems are not flexible enough. So we really tried to do very early on since nearly six or seven years, we are trying to make DALG easier and safer. And the, the, the key information is that we create this uh, small uh, channel where that, that can be located close to the endothelium and to my best knowledge, I think uh, Professor Schmieding will show you a video how easy that works out. 
uh, and give you also some more information about the precision of that system. And that's how it looks like. You do have your OCT, uh, you do have your shine. That is the channel, that is the H cut. And, and we should not forget, this is now a clinical picture of one of my patients. Uh, that was uh, an Alcus uh, after contact lens wear. Uh, and uh, so we did, we replaced that part of the stroma. We are not doing, we, we didn't never do uh, lamellar keratoplasties of half of the corneal stroma. We are then going deep because uh, we are afraid of interface problems. So in this case, uh, we, 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 you can also see how important that uh, intraoperative uh, visual uh, OCT is because you do your H cut, that is the lamella cut, and then you can create your, your channel and shift it down to 50 microns away from the endothelium. Uh, you do this online, of course, and that's why it's so good to have an online uh, and an intraoperative OCT once you do the cuts. Now that's how it works, and you will see a video later on. Uh, that is right after doing the femtosecond laser cut, you lift that lamella, remove it, find the channel, go in until you are coming to the end, and then you do that big bubble like here. And that works re uh, very reliably. Better numbers you hear later on. Now the next step in this development um, has a different background. Uh, you see the graph diameter over, over the failure rate, and that's a historical situation. Uh, when they started very early on in the 40s at Filatov in, in Odessa uh, in, in, in the 30s, uh, made a big, bigger number of, of, of uh, keratoplasties penetrating at that time, they recognized very, very early on that the that the failure rate is strongly related with the with the diameter of the graft, and it was Kodadost in the in the uh, late 70s who made very clear that starting from an eight millimeter diameter and larger, uh, the uh, immune privilege, how he called it, the immune privilege, uh, does not work anymore. So so in essence, uh, that, that's why when I was a young assistant. Uh, in Berlin, we did crafts between six and maximally seven millimeters. We never did eight, and we certainly never did nine or even more, uh, because we were afraid of the rejection rates. So that is the first point. But there is also another argument, uh, that is the corneal astigmatism, because I still have patients that have been done in the 50s here in Zurich, and they have very clear, wonderful corneas, no endothelial steps, but they have an astigmatism of 15 diopters. And can, if they cannot wear contact lenses, they cannot see with that eye. So clear cornea, but the patient cannot use it. And that's why also the corneal astigmatism is, is a, is plays a role. And already uh, Herbert Kaufmann made very clear in one of his publications that the diameter of the graft is inversely related with the corneal astigmatism. So the smaller the graft is, the flatter it gets and the more astigmatism you get. And the wider, uh, the, the bigger the graft is, the less astigmatism you're creating. Uh, you're coming down from more than 10 diopters down to three diopters on average, if you use a big optical, if you use a big graft. Now, now you, you may recognize that here in the middle, obviously, is the optimum if you don't, if you do a penetrating cataplasty, but um, in the old days, but with the femtosecond laser, we can look for the best of the two worlds. We take the small graph at the endothelial level in order to avoid rejection rates, and we take a big graph at the outer surface of the graph in order to minimize astigmatism. And that's what you're seeing here. It's the so-called mushroom dulk. Again, you cut this out, remove it, and bring the same amount in with it that was cut also. And here, then you get the mushroom dulk. A mushroom because it's thin here and wide there. 
Um, currently, we are using, I've done now three of them during the last months. Uh, in the outer diameter is nine millimeter, the inner is seven millimeter. Uh, the last patient was a radial keratotomy patient and the risk of uh, not being being able to create a dark was high because it looked like this, it was 30 years ago, and uh, it looked like that, uh, th that I may perforate, and that's why we did that mushroom dark in this patient. Uh, that is one of those pictures in a pig eye. You see, you do your, you create your, your mushroom dark, you have your lamella, and here again, you create your uh, channel and the end point of the channel, you can shift uh, 50 microns or 80 microns away from the endothelium and therefore you can create the mushroom dull easily and say with the same safety as it were normal dull. Now in conclusion, uh, the femtosecond laser assisted dull makes life of us corneal surgeons much, much easier. I can sleep better after that of those surgeries. The channel configuration needs individualization and optimization. You can shift this from the middle towards the cone, and we just need your and you need your own nomogram, how close you go to the endothelium, and uh, depending on the instrument instrumentation you have to available. Um, although conversions uh, are have become rare, it's good to have a mushroom dialed as a kind of safety uh, rescue uh, and, and visual rehabilitation after, after the dialg, whether it's mushroom or normal femtosecond laser dialg, can be attempted as early as one month after dialg. And routinely we are sending, after the one month follow-up, we are sending our patients uh, in the IROC in the third floor where the optometrist sits and, and fits the nice ministerial lens. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, Professor Seiler. Indeed, it was amazing. Uh, and uh, we know that DALC is typically a, uh, an art uh, procedure. Uh, we now see that it is a science that using FEMTO technology, we can make it systematic and accessible to any surgeon. Thank you indeed. Uh, next, we move to Professor Gerald Schmidiger, and then we see the results of DALC using FEMTO technology. Hello, Shady. Thank you for the invitation and um, greetings to all the participants of this meeting. Uh, thank you uh, also to Tima for giving me the opportunity to present our data here on FEMTO second laser assisted DALC surgery. As we already heard, um, keratoplasty in times of corneal crosslinking has changed. Corneal crosslinking has reduced the incidence of keratoplasty, and this has been shown in two trials recently, uh, which evaluated periods between 2012 and 2014. And they showed that there was a reduction of keratoplasty procedures performed for keratoconus between 25 and 50% compared to uh, a time uh, before in the introduction of, of crosslinking. Uh, however, indications for keratoplasties for keratoconus will remain, uh, mainly due to the side effects of the long-term use of contact lens wares, like scarring, as we know from the CLEC trials, or treatment failures of cross-linking or cross-linking induced complications like infection or scarring. So there will be patients, uh, keratoconic patients that need keratoplasty. However, penetrating keratoplasty is probably not the best way to perform procedure in these cases, as we already heard, because with dark surgery, we have a lower risk of endothelial graft rejection and we have a potentially longer graft survival in these cases. So as Professor Seil already mentioned, um, there are some trials that evaluate the advantage of dark surgery over penetrating keratoplasty. And one Cochrane review evaluated two randomized controlled trials, and they did not find any significant difference in visual acuity, spherical equivalent, or keratometric readings in these cases, and they had no graft failure in the dark groups. And a meta-analysis also showed that uh, they evaluated five randomized trials with more than 400 eyes, and they found a significantly better visual acuity in a PKB group, but on the other hand, they found better endothelial cell numbers and significantly lower rejection rate in the dark group. So when we now look at the patients that get keratoplasty in uh, a keratoconic patient that get keratoplasty, so we 
probably trading a little bit of visual acuity for a uh, better graph survival. And when we see that patients uh, for uh, uh, getting keratoplasty uh, for keratoconus are between 30 and 40 years old, and the average graft survival rate is about 20 years in these cases, then uh, we actually see that the potentially reduced uh, need for a repeat keratoplasty most, li most likely outweighs the lower visual acuity that might be inspected, especially in these young keratoconic patients. However, there's a drawback to manual dark surgery, and that is that there's a long learning curve. There's a risk of unintentional penetration during the side cut when done by a uh, guided draft fine system. And there's a risk of unintentional penetration with the big bubble needle or cannula when you have no guiding tunnel. And of course, there's an unknown residual stromal bed, th bed thickness if you have to do uh, a, a manual dark. A femtosecond laser, on the other hand, can help to get better results, uh, namely by a better side cut geometry, a better centration of the trephination, a less damage to endothelial cells of the donor, as, as it has been shown already in two trials, and of course, a higher accuracy concerning the depth of the cut, especially if you have the uh, device that actually provides you interruptive OCD. Um, as the group of Chodmeta and Teosal already showed last year, you have a very precise measurement in these tissues and it enables you to adjust the implant incision with a very high precision intraoperatively. And this helps us to do dark surgery with these platforms. So we can adjust the, uh, the depth of the side cut uh, according to your in, uh, safety distance, which we usually choose by 150 microns. You can adjust the depth of the lamella cut and uh, of course, you can adjust the depth of these uh, of these uh, dark cannula uh, ports that we create. And with these device, we can actually go as close as 50 microns to the endothelium uh, to get a, a very high rate of big bubble, uh, big bubble creation. So as already mentioned by Theo, uh, the company now came out with a new software that has provided us with the color-coded uh, projections to simplify uh, the, the treatment and also provides us to perform mushroom dark procedures. The advantages of that have, have been already explained by uh, Theo Silo. So what we did now is we performed a clinical uh, study which was designed as a retrospective elaboration of pro prospectively collected data of two surgical centers uh, where we compared manual dark surgeries to femtosecond laser assisted dark surgeries between the years 2011 and 2017. Uh, those surgeries were performed at the Medical University of Vienna and also at the IROC Institute in Zurich. Group one uh, consisted of manual dark cases, which were 51 eyes, and the group two consisted of femtosecond dark cases, and these have been 73 eyes. Most of the patients were in the age between uh, 40 and, uh, and uh, uh, 30 and 40 years. Um, we had more men than female in these groups, and about 75% of the cases that had surgery on were uh, keratoconic patients. The other were mainly corneal scars or corneal dystrophies. We looked at different surgical parameters like success of big bubble uh, procedures, the rate of microperforation or decimate ruptures, the conversion to penetrating keratoplasty, the rate of rebubbling, and also the surgical time. Further, we evaluated visual acuity and keratometry in these cases, three months after surgery, after suture removal, of course. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the results, and these are the most important results on these slides, is the uh, achievement of successful type one bubbles. When we look at the manual dark in the first row, we see that we had a quite high number of success rate in the manual dark group already. Uh, different studies showed uh, manual dark uh, successful big bubble maneuvers between 50 and 60%. We already have 70% here. However, in the femtosecond dark group, we had an increase here to 82%. However, this difference was not statistically significant. But on the other end, the rate of microperforation went down from 42% to 19%. The rate of conversion to penetrating keratoplasty was halved from 33 to 12%. And both of these values were statistically significant. And also the rate of rebubbling went down from 15 to 5%. You might expect an increase of surgical time when using a new device. But however, uh, when we looked at that at, the, uh, at uh, the site in Vienna, 
there was really no difference in surgical time uh, between these two procedures with about 70 minutes per case in both uh, groups. When we uh, look at the sites a little bit more uh, in detail, we see that the successful type one creation was different in the manual dark group in center one and center two. And the conversion rate was also different in the manual dark group uh, from uh, 0.5 to 0.1 in the center one and center two. And this is inversely correlated to the number of rebubbling. So that shows us that there is a surge independent factor as well. However, in both groups and in both centers, we saw an increase in the successful type one uh, procedures and also in the, in the reduction in the conversion to penetrating keratoplasty. So the manual dial group showed four cases of unintentional perforation during the manual trephination or needle insertion, and none of these cases was observed in the femto dial group. And further, concerning dark and cross-linking, at the Vienna site, we performed two cases that had a surgery after cross-linking and no difference during the surgical uh, procedure were observed. This is uh, in, uh, in agreement with a study that has been published uh, already three years ago, which showed that eight eyes out of 101 eyes uh, that had dark surgery, and they also did not find any difference in complications intraoperatively or uh, postoperative outcomes between eyes that had prior corneal crosslinking. So there is a high chance that you can perform a dark surgery uh, with no complications in cases that had prior crosslinking. The visual acuity results and the k-mean uh, results did not differ between the manual dark and the femtosecond dark groups, as you would might expect. So in conclusion, there was a significant lower rate of perforation or conversion to penetrating uh, keratoplasty in the femto dial group. There were no unintentional perforations during trephination or canalula insertion, insertion in the femto dial group, and we had a very high big bubble success rate in the femto dial group. So to sum up, the femto second laser increases the reproducibility of dark surgery and most likely helps to make dark surgery more accessible to unexperienced surgeons. And we also see that in our site in Vienna, where we train the young assistant uh, surgeons, which have a very high success rate already when using the laser. And further, a mushroom dark, which will be available now uh, with the new software, might further increase the success rate due to the smaller internal transplant diameter, which respects the anatomy of the dual layer uh, compared to a large diameter uh, side cut with 90 degrees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schwindinger, for this wonderful presentation. Indeed, it's interesting to notice that um, with femtodoc, the type one bubble rate is actually higher. And that's interesting to notice. Um, we move next to the last talk of the session um, and I'll be presenting in, uh, basically talking about femto AK in debulking astigmatism in um, a corneal graft after keratoconus. So, um, What's the main problem in uh, corneal grafts, whether penetrating or whether even sometimes dull? As Professor Seiler said, um, many of them are clear, but we have large or irregular astigmatism. And has been shown that about 10% of patients with penetrating or dull have uh, high astigmatism. But if we look at keratoconic patients, this figure is even larger. Unfortunately, some of the old data we have um, shows 27%, but we don't have much of a newer data. But 27% at least is a, a lot of, uh, is a big number. Now, some of these are actually very irregular, like you see here. Some actually are kind of more of a bow tie and others are kind of an irregular bow tie. To deal with these large astigmatism is a nuisance. And again, Devising femto uh, AK to deal with them is intuitive. However, there is a major difference between post-graft eyes and native eyes. This has been shown by a study by uh, Wilkins, Judd Mata, and Larkins back in Moorfield, 2005, showing that as opposed to femto AK in virgin eyes, femto AK in graft eyes are proportionate to the pre-op astigmatism in that graft, meaning that the larger the astigmatism, the more uh, the effect of the arcuate keratotomy. 
And hence, the only main nomogram that one could follow at least before developing their own personal nomogram is a multi-center study based on three centers. One is in Canada, the other is in California, and the third in Florida, Boston Palmer, looking at these 140 eyes using the FS laser. And then uh, based on that, a nomogram was developed. The trend in that nomogram was typically under correction. And if you look, the difference between the target induced and the surgical induced astigmatism was 3.62 diopter. So of course, here we're not aiming for perfection, we're aiming at debulking, as one might say. If we examine this nomogram, which has not been validated yet, but basically as a, a retrospective uh, backfitting to what, uh, uh, what the results show, 67% of the surgically induced astigmatism could be accounted for by preoperative astigmatism, arc length, depth, and optical zone. However, 33% are actually unknown or based on inherent factors. And that's again, what one needs to expect from FEMTO-AK, not really a perfect science uh, to uh, treat or tackle completely your astigmatism as we know in virgin eyes, but the fact is we need to debug that astigmatism to deal with it later with other technology that are more refined and more accurate. But why is that? Why do we have such a difference between virgin eyes and um, keratoplasty eyes? Well, first, of course, the donor age is unknown most of the time when you're operating, but more importantly, stromal haze. Stromal haze could affect the tensile strength, depending on your, where your femto AK is gonna be. The very same force causing you high astigmatism is gonna yield really high when you uh, perform your femto arcuate keratotomy. And that is behind the fact that your, actual, your effect is as high as the preoperative astigmatism. That's why the same incision can produce much more with higher astigmatism preoperatively than with lower astigmatism. Again, the other uh, possibility would be subepithelial haze. Again, it's not deep stromal haze, but subepithelial haze could be responsible again for a large preoperative astigmatism and a large uncertainty when you perform your FAM2AK. And again, as much as the Zemer Z8 is the best platform to tackle these, and we're gonna show why, we need to keep in mind that we needed more for safety. So what the Z8 really touts in terms of OCT guided incisions, and this comes really handy when you target 90% depth, because I don't wanna do it blind, I wanna do it under full guidance of OCT real time online minimal collateral damage, because again, I don't want to damage the endothelium when I really go 90% depth to treat these very high um, astigmatis. And then finally, no bridges, because I want some effect finally to be able to debug them. And that's the very reason why we sometimes have a lot of stress when we operate at 90% depth up in the clinic. If we perforate, we will need to end up with sutures and with uh, uh, low energy and a femto guided, uh, an OCT guided procedure, we definitely feel more relieved. And because we don't have much bridges and because those AK incisions come out all the way without even me needing to go through the uh, Sinsky and cut bridges or go all the way to the epithelium, I really felt that the nomogram from the multicenter study was actually overcorrecting not all the time, but often. So as opposed to what I would expect with an undercorrection with a Z8 because of probably perfectly performed uh, uh, incisions, I had more often overcorrection than undercorrection. And I had to uh, uh, change the nomogram and make it more adaptable and actually decrease it even more. And I went more with increasing optical zone to decrease irregular astigmatism and actually uh, lessen the effect and shifted a little bit more uh, uh, the depth as uh, the astigmatism went down. So again, for uh, 13 to 17 or 10 to 20.5, I would go 90% depth, alternate 90, just like the multicenter nomogram, but I would shift from six to 6.3 optical zone. Uh, for lesser astigmatism from 7.9 to nine, I would go 85% and I would shift my optical zone to 6.5. This would also allow me to get more regular corneas at the same time, still have a good effect to tackle these um, high astigmatism. Again, to perform that, I would always go first with limbal marking. And I would use uh, an app like the Baritoric app to make sure that my marking are within a certain uh, angle. And even if they're not 180, I can account for that 
with my uh, treatment and subtract the angle with the planned angle on the Z8. I would always go for the visual axis because the topography is aligned with corneal vertex. So I would, under the, uh, the, the microscope, I will uh, stain the visual axis, except if the graft is decentered. So I'll have to basically go and compromise between visual axis and um, the center of the graft. I would like to extend my limbal marking because typically when you perform your uh, suction, uh, you won't see very well the limbal marks sometimes, and I would like to extend them as you can see here. And again, I would um, uh, use the limbal marks, the three of them, for to act like a crosshair, just in case the central mark is not clear, I would, it would act like a crosshair to know exactly where to place. It is very important to do that because as opposed to a regular LASIK flap, these corneas will shift a lot and I wanna make sure that I'm performing my AK dead in the center of my visual or my corneal vertex. So this is exactly how these uh, marks are extended from the limbal dots all the way to your treatment. If you want to take a look at an actual video, you first center uh, these AK marks on your uh, central marks. You rotate them to get aligned with your um, extended limbal marks, as you can see here. Uh, then you go ahead and perform the OCT scan. And again, this is vital, especially if you're going 90% depth to debulk very high sigmatism of 10 diopters or more. And the system will uh, perform the OCT scans uh, three times at the periphery, at the center, and at the periphery, again, of uh, the marks. And then if everything is okay, um, you can go ahead and perform the incision. Of course, this is four times speed for the sake of time. And again, this is uh, the, how neat they get right off uh, the procedure and on the slit lamp. And for those who really like to perform femto uh, AK, or if you're seeing a patient that you've performed and you're not sure how much, you have a software online that will allow you to do many things, including from a slit lamp uh, snapshot, coordinateanalysis.com to uh, introduce uh, the white to white. And then after that, you can create any type of points and get the coordinates. As you see here from uh, point one, you can set it as a reference. And then from point one to point two, you can see it's 89.1. So it's actually 90 degree exactly as planned. Again, set the reference from point three and point three to point four, the arc is about 90.3. So exactly as planned with the Z8. You can also look at the cornea graft. If you wanna know, if you wanna go really far and make sure you're not getting into the graft interface and you can label point five and point six and you can get the distance between them. In that case is about 8.5 millimeter uh, cornea graft. Uh, taking a look at few cases performed, this is a 13.27 diopter, uh, more or less symmetrical uh, bow tie. And as you see here, after debulking, it, you have 1.99, and that's pretty much a happy patient. This is a more interesting case because it has a lot of irregularities, and probably this is due to the very, uh, the, the differential stromal haze uh, we have, the subepithelial haze as well. So this is a 13.8, very irregular, and you see it's also a flattening bow tie as well. Uh, so I don't expect a perfectly nice result, but still you have 5.52. And now this, if needed, is amenable with a topography guided laser. And that's the nice thing. Again, the concept of debulking and fine tuning with a, uh, a different technology later. So again, the conclusion here is um, that Fento AK with the Z8 with intraoperative OCT is safe, is efficacious, especially safe when you go really deep and it serves a purpose of debulking, fine tuning with the excimer, with phakic uh, IOLs, with toric IOLs, or even with spectacles can come second. Thank you. So this, uh, this brings us to the Q and A uh, session. Uh, uh, my first question is for uh, Professor Escardo. Uh, it will be interesting to see uh, um, if you notice the same results post cornea rings after cross-linking than before cross-linking, since this is a cross-linking session, uh, I mean, this is a cross-linking meeting, have you noticed in terms of uh, uh, astigmatism and higher order aberration, uh, whether you're getting very similar results, less or better results before cross-linking to patients who have had cross-linking? Okay, we always do cross-linking first, and then according to the results, we implant the ring. Uh, we published that in Cornea 2 around maybe three years ago. Um, basically, the idea is sometimes you have more flattening effect. So you are not sure if you are implanting the ring at the same time 
and you have gonna have the same outcome, you see? That's why uh, I always wait. For me, the most important thing is to halt the progression of the disease, and then I can choose the green, I can choose a fake IL, uh, according of the patient, right? But always I do cross-linking first. And the second question after that, have you had any problem uh, with energy setting using the Z8 in cross-link patients? I use the same energy. I don't change nothing on my settings when I implant the ring after cross-link. The next question is actually, another question is for uh, Professor Seiler. Uh, what would be a case where you wouldn't bother with femtodot, you would directly go with penetrating. Would it, would there be a case like that? In keratoconus? Right, I mean, you, would, you wouldn't you would bother with femtodot. You would say, this is a case where femtodot will not work. I'm gonna go with penetrating keratoplasty. Was that a case where you wouldn't even attempt? No, I, I'm, I, I cannot imagine such a case, except it was a penetrating, um, a penetrating injury. I mean, if you have a scar going through and through, there is no way to try it out. But even a re re uh, keratoplasty, I'm still trying today uh, the, the 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 mushroom dug, uh, so so that in those cases where we can uh, save the decimates membrane, we are we, we are saving endothelial cells, and in case I'm damaging the decimates membrane, I still uh, have only a minimal loss of endothelial cells. So I. There is nearly no case where I would not go for a mushroom dog, uh, except in, pen, uh, in, in, in post-traumatic uh, corneas. Not you. Great. Thank you, Professor. Um, another question for Professor Schminiger. Um, if a patient has a cross-linking done and developed severe haze, we've seen a lot of these patients with severe haze, and obviously they would fail, and the next step would be femtodog. Uh, have you had any problem in the energy or would you change the energy uh, uh, in, in uh, dealing with those patients a priori? Uh, noting, noting that this is not a regular cross-linking patient, this is a cross-linking patient with substantial haze. Yes, uh, that might be an issue, uh, but there are two things uh, to mention in these cases. First, you can uh, fine tune the settings. So you can go up with energy levels or you can go down with cutting speeds to come over these uh, central scars if you perform a lamellar cut. But on the other side, you can also uh, switch uh, to and turn off the lamellar lamella cut now with the new software. So you can perform the same surgery uh, without doing a central lamellar cut uh, but getting your dog tunnel from the epithelium and still performing uh, a mushroom keratoplasty or a, a nice side cut with the, with the femto laser. And since uh, scars usually are central, especially after corneal cross-linking, um, you still have a very nice procedure done with the femto laser. Uh, that might be a different uh, situation in, for example, herpetic cases or, 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 or neovascularized corneas. Uh, in these cases, femtosecond laser procedures might be difficult uh, because the laser will not go through blood vessels and will not go to very densely scarred uh, peripheral cornea. But in keratoconic eyes, this is usually no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, that's so true. Um, can, may, may I just add that I got, I got punished during one of the panels in Beirut by Professor Seitz, and he said, um, "Dalk is not indicated in post-herpetic scars. I remember right. that, I was there at the time. So I went on the way back, or I went to Google and to, to NIH uh, PubMed, and indeed uh, they published a case where um, they, they, they where after re they found, uh, Hepatic uh, um, inclusions in the in the new transplanted endothelium, and of course you could imagine that if the if the if the herpes virus sleeps in the endothelium and you do a new dulk, uh, you you may end up in the same problems. But but on the other hand, I think that is not a real danger. So in those cases, uh, might maybe you will have to do a DMIC later on anyway. Because uh, because that endotheliitis that you are creating uh, that the herpes virus is creating 
might not be solved by even a penetrating only. You could do your dark, save whatever you want, and then you could do later on, if necessary, if you have an endotheliitis, then you still can do a small DMEC with only seven, seven milliliters, which is not a big deal. So, so in essence, even in, 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 in herpetics cars, I'm going for the dark first, because uh, I haven't seen that before, but in case I would, I would know what to do if we got an endotheliitis after a dark. And that's interesting. And again, we don't know exactly um, how often. I mean, that's the case report, wasn't it? So we don't know how often this uh, would be interesting to see a study. Yeah. yeah. And you can get a peripheral recurrence as well, right? Absolutely. Well, you can get them anyway. And my, 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 my logic trace was, uh, since I know that we get that we get recurrences in herpes uh, five years or eight years later, it makes sense to make a dive because you can change the button, which is easy, which I did in a few cases here in Zurich. So, so in essence, uh, if, if you if you do then another penetrating cataplasty after the second or the third uh, herpes recurrency, then you're in trouble because there is no endothelia left anymore. Again, um, with this, we conclude our webinar. I would like to, to thank the speakers for their uh, time and their valuable expertise. I would like also to thank the uh, attendants for uh, participating. And thank Zimmer for making all this possible. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.